I'd like to say hi to all of our campuses and for those who are joining us online, if you take out your message notes, we're starting a new series uh, this weekend. Kay and I are starting a series called Awesome Relationships. Next week we're gonna look at awesome families. The week after that, awesome friendships. The week after that, a special message for single adults in our church on how do you find the love of your life. And I've got a good friend of mine, Neil Clark Warren, a Christian counselor who founded a little thing called eHarmony. <laughs> and I've asked the founder of eHarmony to come and talk about how do you find the love of your life. So you better get your notes ready for that weekend since about a third of our church are people who are single adults. Now, this weekend, I want us to look at fighting for an awesome marriage. Look, take out your notes and look at the verse at the top. Paul says this, now Paul was not married. Paul was a single adult. And St. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 7, 7. We're all given different gifts. God gives the gift of marriage to some, and to others he gives the gift of singleness. So not everybody's supposed to be married. Uh, God says uh, in his word that we get different gifts from him. Some he gives the gift of marriage and some he gives the gift of singleness. Old translations call it the gift of celibacy. Uh, but we, everybody knows what it is, it's singleness. Now, how do you know if you have the gift of singleness? <laughs> I know you're waiting with bated breath for this. And here's the way, if you have any desire to get married someday, you don't have this gift. That's the telltale sign, okay? If you say, you know, really, I'd like to be married someday. I'd like to have a, a wife. I'd like to have a husband. Then you don't have the gift of singleness. The gift of singleness, when God gives it, means I'm perfectly happy to live the rest of my life not married. That's the gift of singleness. Now, whether you are, have never been married, or um, you're divorced, or you're separated, or you're widowed, or you are currently married, regardless of what state you're in, the next verse applies to all of us. Look at this verse. Hebrews 13, four, marriage should be honored, read it with me, by everyone, circle that, by everyone. So regardless of whether I ever marry or not, or whether I've been married in the past and I'm not now, I am to honor marriage. The Bible says, by God, everyone is to give honor to marriage. Now sadly, marriage is no longer honored by everyone in our society, in fact, just the exact opposite. Uh, today, marriage is dismissed as irrelevant by many people, as an archaic thing, who needs to get married? That's something somebody made in another generation or in another culture, a man-made uh, lifestyle choice, and really uh, it's dismissed. Nobody needs to get married today. Uh, it's demeaned by many people. Marriage is demeaned as a career buster. You're getting married, well there goes your career. It's, it's down the pike, it's down the tube. Uh, marriage is delayed, people are delaying marriage more and more, many times for the wrong reasons. Now there are good reasons for delaying marriage, but there are also selfish reasons for delaying marriage. Marriage is being redefined, it's being ridiculed, it's being demeaned, it's being denounced, it's being discouraged, marriage is disrespected. We don't live in a culture where marriage is honored by everyone anymore. And even Christians fall for this trap. And, and part of the problem is nobody knows the basics of marriage anymore. 50 years ago, if I were to go out on the street and say, tell me the purposes of marriage, they could give you the five or six purposes of marriage. Nobody knows these today. And so marriage is treated like just one more little lifestyle choice. It is not. It's far more important than you realize whether you ever get married yourself or not. And it's absolutely essential God gave it to us, marriage, for six reasons. Most people don't know why marriage matters. In fact, most people either A, have an incredibly unrealistic view of marriage, which there's no way anybody could measure up to it, uh, or two, they're just flat out wrong about the meaning and the purpose and the design of marriage. Most people don't get it right. Now, the reality is marriage won't solve all your problems. 
Let me correct that. Marriage won't solve any of your problems. <laughs> uh, anybody married want to give a testimony right now? Okay. Now, a lot of people think marriage creates problems. I didn't have problems till I got married. Oh, no, 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 that's wrong too. Marriage doesn't solve your problems. Marriage doesn't create your problems. Marriage reveals problems. It reveals problems. If I'm cranky, my marriage is gonna reveal it. If I'm a perfectionist, my marriage is gonna reveal it. If I'm fearful and insecure and a worry wart, my marriage is gonna reveal it. If I'm bitter and angry and controlling and manipulative, my marriage is gonna reveal it. Marriage don't create problems. Marriage reveal them. They just show up in marriages like in no other relationship. I, I've got friends who've gone through multiple relationships and some have been in multiple marriages and, and some, sometimes I'm counseling somebody and I say, I don't understand. Uh, you know, I've been married multiple times that uh, my relationships just suck. And I wanna say, well, what do you think's the common denominator? <laughs> you are. You know what the problem with my marriage is? Me. You know what the problem with your marriage is? You. And, and, and so we bring problems into marriage and marriage simply magnifies what's already a problem that maybe it's masked when I'm living as a single adult. So marriage isn't gonna solve all your problems. It reveals them. Marriage will not turn your life into a picnic. Uh, marriage will not balance the harmonic convergence of the universe. It, there are a lot of things marriage can't do, but it does have a God-designed function. It does have a God-designed form, and it is far more important, marriage is far more important than you realize. In late uh, November, next month, uh, Pope Francis of the Catholic Church is having an international conference on why marriage matters. And he's asked two speakers from America, and I'm one of them. Okay? So, I thought I would share a little bit today before Kay comes out. Uh, I'd share with you what I'm gonna tell the Pope. Actually, I'm sure he already knows these. I, I guarantee you he knows these. Uh, but I am gonna share this uh, in greater detail at this international conference. Now, I can't go into these six reasons but, uh, in detail, but I, wanted, I want you to just list these before we get into how do you fight for an awesome marriage. I want you to know the six reasons why marriage matters, this brief overview, because you need to be able to explain it to other people, because nobody around you, nobody in culture, nobody you know getting married or getting divorced knows all six of these. They just don't think about them. So let's look why God designed marriage. Number one, write these down. First, God created marriage for the connection of men and women. God created marriage for the connection of men and women. Now I wanna show you a verse uh, up on the screen in just a second. 1 Corinthians 11.11 11 says this on the screen. In God's plan, men and women need each other. Do you know how radical a statement that is today? A lot of people don't believe that. There are a lot of people who say, women, they don't need men. Why would I need a man? And a lot of men say, why would I need a woman? Well, you do. And the God who designed you, created, whether you ever get married or not, if you're a woman, you need men in your life. If you're a man, you need women in your life, why? Because nobody holds the full image of God. Women get part of it, men get part of it, and we need each other. God wired it this way. God thought up gender, God thought up sex, what a God. <laughs> and God thought up marriage. He thought it all up, it was his idea. It wasn't some man-made construct. Now, the Bible goes back to the very beginning in the creation of the first couple and the first marriage. And in Genesis chapter two, the Bible says God creates Adam and he doesn't make Eve yet. Why did God make man and then woman a little bit later? Why didn't he make them both at the same time? Because obviously he had every intention. I think he did it for Adam's benefit. I think Adam, 
he wanted Adam to realize how much he needed women in his life. Now the Bible says this in um, Genesis 2.18. It is not good, this is God talking, it is not good for the man, that's Adam, to be alone. I will make a companion who is right for him. I'll make a companion who is right for him. I will make, now notice, the first thing you need to realize is marriage, gender, sex, men and women, all the differences, this is a God-given thing. And God intended marriage, one of the purposes of marriage, is as an antidote to loneliness. Look at the next verse. He says there, it is not good for men to be alone. Now, there are many, he says, I'm gonna make a companion, and many companions are important in life. You need companions in all your areas, but there's nothing like the companionship of a marriage. You can talk to any married couple, and they will tell you, yes, there are many other kinds of relationships, and they're all good in life, but nothing at all compares to the companionship of a man and a woman who are committed to each other for the rest of their lives. There's no other relationship that could possibly compare that is in a relational class by itself. And God calls that marriage. Now here's what Jesus had to say about it, Mark 10. God's plan has been seen from the beginning of creation. When he made us, male and female. God made males, God made females. And God chose what he wanted you to be. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united as one body. Now, since they are no longer two but one, God sees a married couple as one, no one should separate them for God has joined them together. Now this is a very important passage of scripture uh, and I could spend a lot of time on it. Let me just make three points at it. That passage says three things. Number one, marriage is God's plan. It's not a human plan, it's not a human idea, it's not a tradition that we can just throw out. God invented marriage when he invented you, when he invented me, when he invented humanity. Marriage is God's plan. Second thing that verse says is that marriage is between a man and a woman. There are a lot of other relationships, but those aren't marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman. And their body parts fit together and they fit together for a purpose, the creation of everybody else. And the third thing it says is marriage is to be permanent. It says what God joins together, God joins a couple in marriage, no one, no one else should separate. It's meant to be permanent, meant to be life. Do you realize how radical those three statements are? That marriage is God's idea and plan that marriage is for a man and a woman, and that marriage is to be permanent. Nobody believes that anymore, but it's still the truth. It's still the truth. It's still the way God designed marriage, and just because we live in the real, not necessarily the ideal, doesn't mean we get to say the ideal doesn't exist. It does, it does. Now, as a pastor, I have done, I don't know how many thousands of weddings. I, I couldn't count how many weddings I've done, one of the things I like about the modern wedding is that people are writing their vows now. I, I think that's good in one sense because it's better than just saying, I do. I mean, I, when, when people write their own vows, they tend to express more of themselves and you get to hear their love and that for the other person, and that's a good thing. But there's also a downside of people, people writing their own vows today and it's this, they're leaving out God. I can't tell you how many vows I've heard that are really more like a junior high social contract. <laughs> I will love you as long as, this, as the sun shines. <laughs> well, what happens when it rains tomorrow? Okay, you get a divorce then? I will love you because you make me feel so great. Well, what happens when they get in the hospital and they can't make you feel great. Do you divorce them then? I love you because you're so beautiful. What, I hate to tell you this, she's gonna lose her beauty and you already have. <laughs> okay? That's I love you if, I love you if. That's conditional love. That's not a love that, that makes a marriage last. 
So a lot of contracts today in marriage really sound like a you know, 36 month lease for an auto. It's like, I love you as long as we both shall love. Really? I love you till debt do us part. Or divorce do us part. They're leaving out God. The first thing about marriage is that God created it and he created it for the connection of a man and a woman for life. Number two, God created marriage for the multiplication of the human race. For the multiplication of the human race. It's how we all got here. You are sitting where you're sitting and you are listening online where you're listening online because a couple got together and made you. And this was God's idea. God populated the human planet through marriage. For thousands of years, billions of people have come on into existence because men and women got married. And God says, this is part of my plan. Now let me give you a little background on this. The Bible says that God is love. We've talked about this many times. That's his character, it's his nature. The only reason there's love in the universe is because God is love. If God was not a loving God, you would not have any love in your life. There would be no love in the universe. The only reason you are able to love is because you, as a man or woman, were created in God's image. Squirrels don't love because they're not made in God's image. Worms don't love because they're not made in God's image. Ants don't love because they're not made in God's image. But men and women have the capacity to love because we're made in God's image. And God said, I want to love and I want to express my love. And the Bible says everything that God has made, he made it simply in order to love it. You were made in order for God to love you. That's why you exist. If God didn't want to love you, you wouldn't exist. Everything in the universe, God made to love it. And the Bible says that God created the universe because he wanted a family to love. So he created the universe so he could create the human race, so he could love us, knowing that some of us would choose to love him back, and then we would live with him forever and ever and ever in his eternal family in heaven. Now think about this. God chose everybody who's gonna be in heaven to come into existence through marriage and sex. That's the way he chose. Nobody would be in heaven if God hadn't created marriage. Because everybody's come into existence through the tool that he designed. Now, let me show you some verses. Genesis 1:27 says this. For God created people in his own image. He patterned them after himself, creating both male and female with his image. Then, so not every, males don't have only the image of God, females, we, we both get parts of God's image. Then God blessed them and commanded them. Now, here's the very first command God gives to the human race. I want you to read it aloud with great gusto. Ready, here we go. God commanded them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Wow. So God's first command to the human race is get married and have sex. That, by the way, friends, is the only command of God the human race has been able to keep. <laughs> and we've done a pretty good job at that one. There are about seven billion of us on the planet because your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents were fruitful and multiplied and filled the land, filled the world. So we're all here. The, the point is that God says, I, I, one of the purposes of marriage is for the multiplication of the human race. It's not the only purpose, but it's a big one. Look at this next verse, Malachi 2.15. I love this in the message paraphrase. God, not you, made marriage. His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And why does he, God, what does God want from marriage? He's real clear. Godly children from your union. Because if people don't have kids, nobody's, those kids aren't gonna be born, they can't get into heaven. He wants godly children from your union. So, guard the spirit of marriage within you. Now, 
This is not an indictment for a childless couple, couples who don't have kids. There are couples who want kids and for whatever reason uh, cannot have them or have been unable to have them. And if you can't, if you're married and you can't have kids, uh, God is not disappointed in you. That's not what this voice is, verse is saying. What it is saying is that we're all alive because some couple got together. And for thousands of years, God has used marriage to populate heaven. And if men and women weren't getting together and, and marrying and having sex, then there would be nobody in heaven. That's the second reason, the second purpose of um, marriage. Number three, the third reason God created marriage, for the connection of men and women, for the multiplication of the human race, third, for the protection of children. God created, God invented marriage for the protection of children. We all know that kids grow better, healthier, stronger when they grow up in a stable family, when they grow up in a marriage with a mom and a dad. Now why did God create marriage for the protection of children? Because when you were born, you were born completely helpless. You could not do anything. You couldn't feed yourself, you couldn't dress yourself, you couldn't change your diaper, you couldn't blow your nose, shoot, you couldn't even turn over on your back when you first started. You were literally totally helpless. God knew that human children needed a safe environment. And you were gonna need somebody to uh, feed you and dress you and nurture you. You were gonna need somebody to protect you, to guide you, to train you to care for you, and all these things. Now, we, I asked my researchers to go out and research all of the national and international studies on the effect of marriage or the lack of a marriage on children. And I asked them to, to find me all those studies. Here they are. Okay, these are not Christian studies. These are studies by Harvard uh, in, you know, university and the United States government and the National Institute of Health. There's about 150 uh, different studies. I want to read to you some of the statistics, if I can find them, of uh, what God said about, I mean, what, what society has said about, um, well, I can't find those notes. Never mind. <laughs> Sit down there. What's in here? You're right, thanks Steve. <laughs> Would you please sit on the front row from now on? <laughs> Leonette, you married a good guy. All right. Let me give you a study, a summary of 150 studies on the impact of marriage, negative or positive, on children. Studies have shown that if children grow up without two parents, without a mom and dad, there's an increased risk that they are gonna A, fail in school. Kids without two parents are more likely to not graduate from college. Kids without two parents are more likely to be involved in substance or alcohol abuse. They're more likely to experience distress, depression, and the risk of suicide. They're more likely to do jail time. They're more likely to live their entire lives in poverty. And they're more likely to increase the risk that they themselves will divorce or will bear children outside of marriage. On the other hand, children who live with their own two parents growing up, statistically proven, enjoy better physical health than children living in any other family form. Now, I didn't say this, this is just what 150 or so studies have shown. How about women? Studies show that women who marry and stay married have lower rates of depression than either single women or mothers cohabitating with a guy that they're not married to. Women who marry and stay married have a lower risk of being a victim of a crime, have a lower risk of violence in their life. Women who marry and stay married have a higher net worth than those who are living with a man they're not married to. Isn't that interesting? How about men? 
Studies have shown that men who marry and stay married earn more money than single men with similar education, job histories, and they li men who marry and stay married live longer than single men. Men who marry and stay married amass more net worth than those who live with a woman and not being married to them. And men who marry and stay married have fewer injuries and illnesses. What's that saying? It's just saying real something real simple. When you do it God's way, it works out better in your life. Now, every single study done has proven that kids develop best with a mom and a dad. Now, we're in a broken planet, broken world. Not everything works right, we know that. But that doesn't mean that we say the ideal isn't real, it is. And the statistics bear it out. Children survive and thrive in families, not in institutions. That's why at Saddleback, we don't believe in, in, in orphanages. We don't fund orphanages, we don't build orphanages, we don't believe in orphanages. Why? Because no kid deserves to grow up in an institution, they deserve to grow up in a family. It'd be more important to help finance a family to take that child in. Yeah, you can clap for that. And, and so we're working in Rwanda. Rwanda will become the first nation on the planet Earth by the end of the next year, hopefully, to be the first nation with no orphanages. Because we've been using in the peace plan churches, moving them into families. Children's interests are best perfected in an intact family. Notice this verse, Proverbs 14, 26. Those who obey and respect the Lord. In other words, do life the way God says to do it. Those who obey and respect the Lord have a secure fortress. Their children have a place of refuge and security. That's what every child needs growing up, a place of refuge and security. And not worrying, is dad gonna walk out? Is mom gonna walk out, or whatever. Now, you know in the past, you used to hear about couples, they say, oh, they, they stayed together for the sake of the kids. And for many generations, when people stayed together for the sake of the kids, that was considered an honor, a compliment. Uh, they're unselfish, they're mature, they stayed together for the sake of the kids. Today, people laugh at that statement. Staying together for the sake of the kids, what are you talking about? You gotta do what's best for you. Really? Do you always have to do what's best for you? That's called narcissism. Can you sometimes do something that's maybe best for somebody else? Can you sometimes do something that's best for somebody for the sake of someone who's more vulnerable than you are? That's called maturity, that's called unselfishness, that's called love. Today in our narcissistic culture, we judge everything by I've gotta do what's best for me. No you don't. In fact, you'll never be happy trying to always do what's best for you. You'll be a selfish little clawed, bitter, Claude, that's a pastor's cuss word. <laughs> Number four, okay, God created marriage for the connection of men and women, for the multiplication of the human race, it's how we all got here, for the protection of children. Number four, this is a big one. God created marriage for the perfection of our character. God created marriage for the perfection of our character. It is in relationships that we learn to be unselfish, we learn to be unloving, and no relationship has greater impact on your life than marriage if you get married. Now, another one of the facts about when you were born, not only were you helpless, you were completely self-centered. Nothing on the planet Earth is more self-centered than a new baby. A baby does not even have the capacity to think about anyone else. All it can think about is itself. I'm too hot, I'm too cold, I'm hungry, I just pooped, I need to be cleaned up, or whatever. The first word a baby learns is, I! <laughs> and it's all about me as a baby. Maturity and the purpose of life is to grow up and realize it's not all about you. In fact, the real happiness comes in giving your life away and being unselfish and being serving and being loving. And so the whole goal of your life is to grow from your total self-centered self as a baby 
to being an unselfish adult. Do you know some adults who are still selfish babies? Yes, you do. Don't look at them, but you know who they are. <laughs> now, this is called maturity. Life is a laboratory of learning how to love. Why is love the most important thing in life? Because God is love, and God wants you to become like him. He wants you to learn how to love. And we learn to love and learn to be unselfish. Now, the Bible says this in Proverbs 18, 1. It is selfish and it is stupid to think only of yourself. And so how do I get out of that? Well, marriage is a lifelong course in learning to be unselfish. Because once you get married, I can no longer think about me. I gotta think about we. I can't think about just me, myself, and I. How many of you as, who are married had to learn pretty quickly that once you got married, you couldn't always do whatever you wanted to do? The rest of you are liars. Because you don't get to do everything you want to do once you get married. You have to learn to compromise. You have to learn to think of the other person. And marriage is the laboratory for learning how to love. Now listen. God wants to make you like Jesus Christ. It's the number one goal in his life. He wants you to grow up. He wants to build character. You're not taking your car, your career, your clothes to heaven. You are taking your character. So the most important thing you can do in life is build your character. The number one tool that God uses in your life to build Christ-like character, if you are married, is your spouse. Oh no. <laughs> yep, because every day you get hundreds of opportunities to not think about you. You get opportunities to think of the other person, to care about them. You say, but my spouse, my husband, my wife, is not even a Christian. They're not a follower of Jesus. They're not a believer. Doesn't matter. They don't have to be saved. They're still God's number one tool to make you like Christ because they're closest to you and they have that most impact. I want you to write this down in your outline. The number one purpose of marriage is to make me holy, not happy. That is so counterculture, but it's the truth. Now here's the interesting thing. Once you become holy, that's how you get happiness. Being holy makes you happy. But God's purpose in your life is to make you holy, not happy. And that's the purpose of God's marriage for your life, is that you become more loving, more giving, more serving, more sharing, more mature, more unselfish. And, and as you become that, guess what? You get more happiness. You'll never be happy if you make it the goal of your life. Happiness is elusive as a goal. It's never meant to be a goal. It's like a butterfly, you're always reaching for it and you never get it. When you start caring about other people rather than your happiness, you're gonna get happy. It's just the way God wired the universe. So God wants us to learn how to love in marriage. Romans 12 says this, love sincerely. Hold on to what is good. Be devoted to each other like a loving family. Excel in showing respect for each other. Do you do that in your, in your marriage? Do you have competition of who can show the most respect? I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat you today in being more respectful to you. I'm gonna beat you today in being more loving. Excel in showing respect for each other. You know, before I got married so many years ago, I really thought I knew how to love a woman. I knew nothing about love, nothing. Now, after 39 years of marriage, I know that love washes the dishes. I know that love takes out the garbage. Shoot, when you're sick, love changes the bedpan. And out of that kind of love comes a connection and a companionship that gives you the strength and the stability to handle enormous amounts of stress. When you know someone that well, and you're just committed to each other because of that reason. Number five, God made marriage for the connection of men and women, multiplication of human race, protection of children, the perfection of our character. God created marriage for the construction of society. Marriage is the fundamental building block of every community, church, state, nation, society, and culture. If you know anything about history, 
you know that where marriages are strong, cultures and nations are strong, empires are strong. You know that wherever marriages and families are weak, cultures, nations are in decline. And we know that, this, that when marriages are devalued, the more a nation is in decline. It's real obvious what direction our nation is headed right now. America's not getting better. It's not getting stronger. It's going the other direction, why? Because we don't value marriage and family anymore. We value, it's all about me. I gotta do what's best for me. We, we've made individualism an idol. So this is for the construction of society. Proverbs 14, 34 says this. Righteousness, that means doing it God's way, lifts up a nation, but sin, not doing it God's way, brings disgrace to any society. Number six, this is the most important reason of all, and many of you have never, ever even heard this reason for marriage, but it's the primary, the deepest, and the most profound reason that God created marriage between a man and a woman, and the unity of sex, and all of that that it involves. God created marriage for the reflection of our union with Christ, for the reflection of our union with Christ. It is, marriage is a metaphor. It is a symbol. It's a walking, living object lesson of how much God loves us and how we are to be in relationship with him. Marriage is a model of a profound spiritual truth. I said it's a metaphor of showing us how we're to relate to God. Now let me show you one of the deepest passages in scripture. And Paul is actually talking about the church and Christ, but he uses marriage as a metaphor. There on your outline, Ephesians chapter five says this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? He sacrifices life, he died for the church. He says, husbands, that's the way you're to love your wife. You're to die for your wife. That's the kind of love you're to have. Sacrificial love, where her needs are so before yours that you sacrifice your life. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He, Christ, died so that he could give the church to himself as a bride in all her beauty. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. No one ever hates his own body, but he feeds it. He, he takes care of it. And that is what Christ does for his church, his body. See, the church is a bride and church is a body. Now the scripture says, and he's quoting the verse in Genesis we just looked at, and the scripture says, a man is united with his wife and the two become one body. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. Go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Paul. I thought you were talking about marriage here, husbands and wives. No, he says, yeah, I know I'm using marriage, but it's a metaphor of our spiritual union with Christ and Christ and his love for his family, his body, his bride, the Christ, the church. So. He says, because marriage is a metaphor of Christ and the church, so each husband must love his wife as much as he loves himself, as he loves himself. And, it says, each wife must respect her husband. Now, that passage is so deep, I'm gonna have to take a whole other message sometime and explain it in detail. But let me just say it this way. This is the most profound meaning of marriage. There's some benefits um, of marriage that are obvious and quantifiable like these. What it does to kids, what it does to women, what it does to men, the benefits of an intact marriage for life are incontrovertible, irrefutable. And, and there are a lot of benefits to marriage that you can just look at you know, empirically uh, judging uh, the scientific data. But this one, 
the most profound meaning of marriage is, is not as easy to grasp. It's harder to understand and appreciate how marriage reflects our union with Christ and our relationship to him. Now, listen. No other relationship on planet Earth, none, none, including parent-child relationship, no other relationship can adequately illustrate our union with Christ the way a marriage between a man and a woman does. This is the strongest reason, this number six, why marriage matters. This is the strongest reason why marriage cannot be redefined. This is the strongest reason why it must be protected at all costs, because we are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ in union with Christ, and marriage is that metaphor. Now let me summarize. What I'm saying, uh, before we get into the practical part, is that it really doesn't matter what other people think about marriage. It doesn't matter what public opinion says. It doesn't matter what the opinion polls say. It doesn't matter what's politically correct or incorrect. What really matters is what God says who invented marriage. And you're gonna live in a culture where this is absolutely counter culture. You now live in a culture that has forgotten why marriage matters. You live in a culture that does not honor it, but actually demeans it, discourages it, ridicules it, redefines it, dismisses it, and on and on. And as a result, we can see what's happening in society. We now have people who go to Las Vegas, get drunk, and in a spontaneous moment go to a wedding chapel, get married, and 24 hours later get divorced, because it's no big deal. It's just a social contract. We have celebrities who spend a full year and millions and millions and millions of dollars on a wedding, and the preparation for the wedding lasts longer than the marriage. We have people going from one relationship to the next to the next in serial marriages. And they don't understand the meaning and the mystery. Now what's amazing about all of this is that when we live in a culture that's forgotten why marriage matters, we still honor and it still makes big news when a couple makes it a long time. And, and it's still big news when we hear on the radio or TV or in a magazine, that couple has been married 60 years. That couple's been married 65, 70. That couple's been married 75 years. Why? Because in spite of all the public and political pressure, we instinctively as human beings inside know and we recognize the beauty and the sweetness of one man and one woman committing themselves to become one flesh and living together in love for their entire lives. That is a beautiful thing. And we know it. And we know it. And we know that deep, deep down inside of us, instinctively, we are wired to want this. Everybody craves the safety of a relationship where you are so fully known and known by each other and it lasts for life. Everybody wants that. So I'm gonna ask in just a second Kay to come out and we're gonna talk a little bit about this. But let me just end with this section, with this part. Twice in the Bible Jesus says there's gonna be no marriage in heaven. Huh? No marriage in heaven. Jesus said it twice. He knows more about it than you or me. Why will there be no marriage in heaven? Because you won't need any of the six reasons marriage exists. In a perfect place, that you're not going to need the multiplication of the human race. In a perfect place, you're not going to need the protection of children. In a perfect place, you're not going to need the perfection of your character. You're not going to need the construction of society. You're not gonna need the reflection of Christ's union. You don't need a metaphor because you're gonna experience the real thing in heaven. But here on earth, marriage matters. And the Bible says we are to honor it whether we're ever married or we're married or lost a maid or whatever, we're to honor marriage. 